Uh, so let's start this part three of lecture three. And we just saw in the previous part how we can have undocumented access points inside code, like trapdoors, backdoors, things like that, that people may have used for testing or just for development. But then if you forget to take it out of your release code, you end up with release software with these special access points or trapdoors, backdoors into your code. Um, so there are some countermeasures for finding and fixing these faults. So these are similar to penetrate and patch. That is the idea is you have a development team that's developing your code and they might forget to take things out of the code that they shouldn't leave behind. And so what you would want to do is let a tiger team that's going to um, be paid just to find faults. So that's what a tiger team is as opposed to a development team. You let them find vulnerabilities and then the tiger team um, finds them and then tells the development team here are all the problems and the development team gets back on the code and patches all these problems. So this penetrate and patch is also considered ineffective because the pressure to fix a fault can take away from design problems. So rather than working on fundamental design problems, um, you work on patching and then fixing one problem can end up causing other failures, all kinds of different problems. So although this has been used in the past in, um, and to fix problems, there are many cases that we'll see later where um, this approach, although it sounds like a reasonable way to do things, is, um, ends up causing more problems. So you want to take the bigger picture into keep the bigger picture in mind. That is, you want to find faults, understand them, and fix them in the context of the system's requirements. So sometimes this does happen with the penetrate and patch, but oftentimes um, you forget about the basic system requirements and then you, your fixes end up causing more problems. There are ba some basic software design principles that you have to keep in mind. So when you're developing software and you want it to be secure software, definitely you want to use modular structure because it's easier to develop. It can be more secure. You want to use encapsulation, object-oriented features, all the ones that might have learned in an object-oriented programming course, they make it easier to identify vulnerabilities. So for example, encapsulation and information hiding may have made it easier to isolate those changes that, for example, we saw in, Mar in the Mars Surveyor problem. Also, if you are in a lot of computer software, you want this ACID properties for transactions that is atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And this is almost all databases basically guarantee these properties. And especially, this is these are especially important when you have um, multi-threaded code. You want atomicity for sure. That's what locks and semaphores and things like that give you is atomicity. And then you also want consistency, isolation, and durability. <clears throat> Another countermeasure is testing. Testing seeks to locate potential failures before they occur. Unit testing is generally considered easy, and it is the easiest of all the kinds of tests. But it still is actually hard sometimes. Every once in a while, you can have very um, complicated methods that are hard to test. Integration testing, that is not just testing a single part of a software, but putting a whole bunch of parts of your software together, it's called integration. That is really hard. It's no easy way to do it. There are tools that allow you to do it, but um, definitely hard compared to unit testing. Regression testing makes sure that when you make a fix, it, you're not regressing. That is, you don't break something else. So for example, that's exactly what happened in the Mars Surveyor project. Uh, something was fixed, but then ends up causing a regression. That is, you go backwards, you fix you, uh, one fix broke something else. So you want to do regression testing all the time. So all these three, and there's even actually more kinds of testing. Um, and these are things that you want to do that will definitely cut down on the number of problems. Okay, so let's change gears a little bit and take a look at a couple of problems that people have come across 
um, when using uh, secure software. So one thing we should we should look at now is uh, TLS and SSL. So TLS stands for Transport Layer Security, and it's the new version of SSL or Secure Socket Layer. So what is Secure Socket Layer? It is a security protocol for encrypted communication between a client and a server. So for example, that was the basis for um, HTTPS a while ago. TLS is just basically a newer version of SSL and it's really the only version that, um, that uh, there are actually a couple of versions of TLS too, but TLS is what, is what we should be using for all um, servers and clients. In a web setting, these can be used with HTTP to establish an encrypted web communication channel or HTTPS. You've probably seen that in, uh, in websites. You see the lock, that means you're using HTTPS. And what that means is you're using, in the old days you were using SSL, but now it's uh, pretty much just TLS. So let's just take a quick look at what happens when you use SSL or TLS. So these days you use public key encryption. We'll talk more about encryption, public key encryption, all of these things later when we look at cryptography, but here's a little preview. So we use these names, Alice and Bob, that's just person A and person B, and one can be a client, like a browser, and Bob can be a server, or vice versa. It's not important. It's just, these are just names. So you'll see these names a lot, Alice and Bob, and Eve would be the eavesdropper. Okay, so Alice, person A, that is, creates a key pair with a public key and a private key. So two keys, public and private, form a key pair. Alice will send the public key, Alice's public key, to Bob, and Bob will use that public key, that is Alice's public key, to encrypt a message and send it to Bob. Sorry, Bob will use Alice's public key to encrypt a message and send it to Alice. Alice gets the message and uses her private key to decrypt it. So that's the important thing is you can use a public key to lock, essentially, lock a message, or maybe uh, encrypt it, and then you can use the private key to unlock or decrypt that encrypted message. Okay, so if this is not clear, definitely this is something that uh, we'll go over in more detail in the encryption part of the course, but for now you just want to know that you have, you can have two keys, a public key that you can give everyone, a private key which is kept secret and you don't give that to anyone. If you give it to anyone then the secret's gone and your encryption scheme you know it's um, basically not going to work because anyone can decrypt messages that are meant for you. Okay so let's say um, we have Bob's browser and you want to get Alice's public key. How do you do this? It turns out um, websites use certificate authorities. Not just websites, many many things use certificate authorities, but that's probably the uh, websites are probably the most common um, instances where you run into this the, this need for certificate authorities. So how does this happen? Alice sends a certificate authority a message. In that message is Alice's public key and some proof that I am actually Alice. So Let's not get into that, but you have to prove to the certificate authority, yes, I am this, let's say, server, and here's my public key. So by the way, I'm introducing this notation. This is security protocol notation. Some of you might have seen it. This is how you send a message. That is, this is the sender, and this uh, arrow, after the arrow comes the receiver. That is, A is the sender, and here in this, uh, in this line, uh, CA is the receiver, and after the colon comes the message, the thing that you are sending. In this case, it's just two things, uh, public key and proof that I am Alice. So this next line, the certificate authority replies to Alice and sends back, and this is security protocol notation again. In curly braces, you have some message, but then it's encrypted using a key. And for now, all you need to know is that encryption involves two inputs, that is a message and a key, and the output 
is an encrypted message. Okay, so in this case, the message, this message that the certificate authority is sending back to Alice is an encrypted message, and you can tell that with the cur because there's the curly braces, and then you see the KCA, that's the key that was used to encrypt, not necessarily sent with the message, usually not, and then inside the actual message itself or the, the thing that's encrypted is the certificate. And, and uh, it says that Alice's key is this. Okay, so Alice has this encrypted quantity and encrypted message. So when a, a browser B asks Alice, who are you? Alice can send the browser B this encrypted thing that it got from the certificate authority, which has, which is an encrypted message saying that here's a certificate proving that this is Alice and Alice's key is here. So Alice can use these certificates for some period of time, let's say for a year or more, and browsers will accept these certificates from many certificate authorities. And you can actually look at in your browser how many certificates you've accepted, probably all the sites that you visited in the last year, pretty much. So it could be a lot of certificates in your browser. Okay, so how does how is this used? So for example, a client, for example, a browser, this is typically what happens uh, when you're browsing the web and you have HTTPS sites, the browser or the client asks for an HTTPS connection to a server the server replies with an SSL certificate like we just saw in the previous slide. So Alice, uh, that's the server, replies with the certificate which it got from a certificate authority. Then the client sends the certificate to a third party certificate authority that extracts the server's public key and generates a session key. So this session key is used differently for a session. You want this encryption and decryption to be ha to be happening very quickly and um, asymmetric public uh, private keys which is what we talked about here these are actually asymmetric keys because uh, they're not the same the the key that you use for encryption is not the key that you use for decryption that's why it's called asymmetric uh, asymmetric keys uh, asymmetric encryption is slow compared to symmetric encryption so we'll talk more about this later, but you want to get a rough idea. And so in this slide on um, step four, you get a session key, which is um, almost always a symmetric key. So you, have, you get a session key that is encrypted using the server's public key. Um, and to the server, the server verifies the certificate with the certificate authority that is decrypts the session key and then the server sends the protected data to the client using symmetric encryption. Okay, so I know there's a lot to throw at you, but we'll go into the details of encryption schemes later. You just want to get some idea of what all the different steps are. When you do this uh, TLS and SSL, you also send heartbeats. These are encrypted messages that a client can send to a server saying, you know, I'm still here, keep this session active. The server decrypts these messages and sends an encrypted version back and the client decrypts it because it has that symmetric key, checks to make sure it's the same as the original message. Okay, so these are th things that are happening when you're browsing the web. These are all happening in the background. So this was all, so all of this usually works. It so it actually does work. You still, you use it all the time. A couple of years ago, there was this problem called the Heartbleed bug, and that's where an evil client can take advantage of this of bugs in this system and send a malformed message that is a small message but disguised as a big one. The client specifies, it turns out, the length of the message. And so the server says, okay, um, this client is looking for a big message, and it fills this return message using the standard function um, that you will find in most systems, especially if you're using C programming, you're probably familiar with this memcopy, that is memory copy function. 
and it uses the larger length parameter to set the size of whatever it's going to copy and it copies its own memory and this what ends up happening this although this was uh, just uh, very recent just a couple of years ago it ends up basically giving you a buffer overflow and you use this buffer overflow as an attack to harvest information from servers and what happens is that the server sends more information than you really are supposed to and then sends it to the client the evil client then gets all this data and then sifts through it a lot of it's probably just junk but then who knows, some of it might have sensitive data like credit card numbers, PIN numbers, things like that, passwords, all those things. It's possible. And here is a nice XKCD explanation of how the heartbeat, heartbleed bug works in OpenSSL. So keep in mind, the basic idea was just a buffer overflow attack. This was all it was, but it was in the context of all this web traffic and things like that. So it says here, if you can't, I know this is kind of small, you might not be able to read it, but this, for, this first pane says um, how the heartbleed bug works. So here's a client, this person uh, asking the server. So a server, um, are you still there? So that's the heartbeat. If so, reply potato, that is uh, six letters. So uh, the client is asking the server to reply with a six uh, letter message. The server th does some thinking and says, okay, I should reply six letters potato, and it says potato and sends the reply to the client. After a while, you have to send another heartbeat, so the client says, server, are you still there? If so, reply bird, four letters. And the server is doing some thinking and it says, okay, I got the words bird, I got a reply, and it says bird. And then now the client says, ha, uh, server, are you still there? If so, say hat, 500 letters. So it's sending a message pretending, now it's a small message, but pretending that it's a huge message. And the server says, okay, I'm supposed to reply this, uh, reply with this uh, word, hat. But then it copies whatever memory there is beyond those three letters, and it goes up to 500 letters down and it takes all this stuff that's in memory who knows maybe it has some credit card information just randomly might happen to be there takes all of that puts that into a buffer sends it and now the evil client is sort of harvesting this random information in the hope that some sometime it might uh, end up giving the evil client some sensitive information okay so we'll take um, that's so once again the the bottom line is that you're basically just using uh, a buffer overflow attack but using it in the context of all these security mechanisms that you've sort of defeated and you're down to just a buffer overflow attack okay so let's take a break here i'm going to do one more part uh, with the remaining slides for this lecture